I've been back in the office for only a few minutes, already searching the web for any information or folklore on succubus. Or was it succubi? Yeah, fuck it, if I knew. What I did know was that my captain needed to be informed of the situation. The Vampire Council didn't want us lowly humans to know what other nightmares existed out there in the darkness. And I had a feeling if the captain found out about this from anyone else, I'd find myself working sanitation for the rest of my life. I was just about to head for his office when the phone began to shrill. Before I could grab it up, it had been answered by the ever-present Donna, who had already made herself right at home in the far corner of the room. Desks, swivel chair and all. Preternatural squad, she chimed in. How may I assist you? I couldn't help but roll my eyes, wondering if this new schedule actually considered the need to sleep. Yes, detective, she continued. I should tell him right away. Hanging up the phone, she turned to me. That was Detective Hawking. He said that they have another body, and he would like your opinion, you being the supernatural expert and all. The crime scene is at Dell's Tavern on the Lower East Side, also fondly named The Slums. Directions have been added to your PDA, Detective. She sounded like a goddamn robot. Grabbing up my jacket, I headed for the door. Oh, and Carver, she said as I passed. Do try and eat something. I believe there's a vending machine on the second floor filled with stale sandwiches. They go perfectly with the incredibly stale coffee. It's on my list, Donna, I sighed. It's on my list. It was around 5 a.m. when I arrived on the scene. I had grudgingly taken Donna's advice and grabbed a sandwich and a black coffee on the way out of the precinct. Neither was as bad as Donna's prediction, but I had a feeling Donna's tastes were maybe a little more high class than my own. Tossing my empty cup into the passenger side floor, I exited the vehicle. Over here, Carver! Hawking waved at me from the side of the building, where he stood smoking a cigarette. Damn, I laughed. Are we the only two detectives in town, or you just volunteer for this shit? He shrugged. I was just going off duty when the call came in. I was stupid enough to take it. That'll teach you, I grinned at him. I always spend the last five minutes of your shift sitting in the crapper. Well, what do we got, Jason? More the same? Hawking crushed his smoke underfoot. I don't know what to make of this one. It's a goddamn slaughter in there, Hawking replied, rubbing at his brow. From what I can tell, all the women in the place went insane and started slaughtering the men. The only other victim is the guy behind the bar, found in the same state as the other two victims before. Oh, yeah, they're the vampires, of course. Vampires? Don't get excited, buddy. Hawking managed to grin. They're both deceased. Heads torn from their bodies. I thought you might want to look them over. So he said the only other victim. What about the women? Alive. All of them. He found them covered in blood. They seemed to be in some sort of catatonic state. They've already been taken to the local hospital under close guard. Of course, to be checked for injury and psychiatric evaluations. Everything else is just how we found it. Lab guys have done all their little tests and photographed the scene. He's waiting to clean up the mess. He said, nodding towards some bored-looking orderlies. Stood leaning against a black meat wagon. Okay, I said. Lead the way. Dell's Tavern was a small, squat building with a long, shiny bar, a pool table, and one of those old rock and roll jukeboxes, you know, was just filled with such great hits as Jailhouse Rock and a boy named Sue. The air smelled of stale beer from long ago. Blood seemed to be everywhere, splashed across the walls, congealing on the ceiling, and soaking into the hardwood floor. There were bodies, all men, some of them lying on the floor, others slumped over the bar, one even halfway under the pool table, a broken bottle jutting from his lower back, as if he had tried to escape the slaughter. I ignored him, stepped over a man with his face blown to pieces, and headed for the two headless corpses in the corner booth. Hawking followed close behind me. You may want these, he said, handing me a pair of white latex gloves which I struggled with for a moment before reaching down and grabbing up a decapitated head. Just like that, Hawking grimaced. I ignored him and lifted the dead creature's pale lips, revealing the fangs beneath. The other one? I questioned. Under the table. Hawking replied. 
All this way, I said, placing the severed hand on the big detective's hands. Hawking took a sharp intake of breath, but I noted the other man's hands were rocky still. Kneeling down, I grabbed the other head and did the same checks, before placing it gently back down and turning back to Hawking. You can put that down now, I grinned at the look of relief on the other man's face. Hawking looked around for a second, then placed the head on the table, and quickly stripped off his blood-streaked gloves. Okay, I continued. You're two dead vamps, both new bloods. And look at the spinal damage. Now hold on a minute, Hawking interrupted. How do you know they're new bloods? Teeth, I shrugged. They're not retracting. Older vampires have the ability to hide their fangs, sheathe them just like a blade. These two are young bloods, not even dead twenty years yet. Also, by the lack of blood around them, neither of them had fed before they were killed. Whoever did this, I said, going over the first body, was incredibly strong. Even a young vampire is not easy to kill, and to tear the head off a regular old human being is not an easy feat. It reminds a vampire. Looks like the others tried to get away, Hawking said, approaching the body, which was slumped over the table, lying on its side, one arm thrown across the bloody table. Reaching over, I turned the body, revealing bloody gouges across the palm. Defensive wounds, Hawking muttered. These look like claw marks to you, Carver. I ignored the question. Help me get him up onto the table, will you? Let's get a good look at him. Hawking quickly slipped out another pair of gloves and helped me heave the body more fully onto the table, the glass crunching underfoot. The vampire's clothing were torn and bloody, but it was his other hand that interested me. It was pale, streaked with blood, and balled into a tight fist. Now help me get this open, I said to Hawking, who steadied the lower arm whilst I pried at the fingers, using a small pencil like a flashlight. Slowly, as if the vampire was even reluctant in death to give up his secrets, the fingers gave way, revealing a small, sharp, blackened claw within. The hell is that? Hawking gasped. Is that a damn claw of some kind? Looks like our boy here got a piece of whatever killed him, I replied, taking a half-smoked pack of cigarettes from my pocket and dropping the claw inside. Hey, the hell do you think you're doing? Hawking rounded on me. That's evidence. You can't just take that. Listen, I said. I may have someone who can help us with this, and perhaps end these killings once and for all, but I have to take this with me. Hawking's eyes narrowed. What are you not telling me, Carver? I don't like to be bullshitted, especially my own crime scene. Sorry, buddy. I, I uh, can't say right now. For your own good. Then maybe I should decide what's for my own good. And what ain't. I like you, Carver. You seem like a stand-up guy, but I ain't hanging my ass out in the breeze for you. If you take that piece of evidence, I will have to go to the captain. I won't like it, but I ain't risking a suspension or getting fired. I my wife and two kids at home. You go ahead and make that phone call, I said, headed for the door. You can warm him up for me before I get there. It's gonna tear you a new asshole, Hawking called after me. But I was already headed for the door. I had just walked through the office door when I was greeted by a worried-looking dispatcher. Let me guess, I told him before he could even get started. The captain wants to see me ASAP. Uh, well, actually, he said. What he said was to tell that stone-brained son of a bitch that I want him in my office the minute he steps through the door. Message received, I said, turning my back and heading for the elevator. I stepped out, noting the division seemed somewhat darker before realizing the automatic shutters had fallen into place with the rising sun. We wouldn't want any of our new vampire friends to catch a scorching now, would we? Heading for the captain's office, I knocked politely. Get your ass in here, Carver! Taking a deep breath, I stepped inside. The captain was sat behind his desk, a cup of steaming coffee in one hand, his tie askew. He looked tired, badly in need of a shave. You look tired, Captain, I said, taking a seat. Cut the shit, Carver, he snapped at me. I just got off the phone with Detective Hawking. He told me you took vital evidence from the crime scene, and normally I'd bust your ass for it. But it wasn't his crime scene. It was yours. Mine, I blurted, confused. 
You're in charge of the pre-natural squad, aren't you, Carver? I shifted uncomfortably in my chair. Hey, Captain, I ain't sure what I am in charge of. I mean, we, we have our little chats. And the next thing I know, I have my own office, secretary and all. He winced at that. Don't let Donna hear you call her that. Sides, you complaining about having to work with Donna? Every single guy in this division's asked her out, at least one time or another. I don't work with vamps, I said, sullenly. I knew I was being an asshole. I mean, so far, Donna had been nothing but polite. And I was painting everyone with the same brush, blah, blah, blah. But where the vamps were involved, I simply couldn't help it. Look, Carver, he sighed. This thing is as new to me as it is to you. A whole new division just dropped in our lap. Right now, I feel like a drowning man trying to save another drowning man. But that's not why I called you in here. I won't have you destroying another detective's reputation. You mean Hawking? I said, sitting up a little straighter. I thought you said it was my crime scene. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about you using his connections and vice to shut down Bella's place and squeeze her for information. Told you about that, didn't he? I replied, trying to keep the disgust off of my face. He didn't tell me shit, the captain replied, slamming his coffee down on his desk. So wipe that goddamn self-righteous look off your face. He is loyal to a fault and a damn fine detective. Then give him to me, I blurted out. God knows I could use him. The captain leaned back heavily in his chair, mulling it over. Okay, Carver. You can have him. I won't force him. And if he wants in, he's in. But you pull some shit again like you did at Bella's, and I will shut you down before you even get started. And fuck what little higher-ups say. I headed. I held up a supplicating hand. You got it, Captain. Glad to see we're getting on the same page. Now tell me, he said, leaning eagerly forward. Where are we on this case? What'd you take from that crime scene and why? I reached into my pocket and emptied the claw out of the desk. It sat there between us, surrounded by small tobacco flakes. Is that what I think it is? Azan said, prodding at it with one blunt finger. If you think it's some kind of claw, then you'd be right. Vampire? The captain questioned. I thought you were referring to them as Nosferatu here in Vamp City. I grinned. Only when they're around... Azan replied, a small smile playing across his rugged features. Just answer the damn question, smartass. No, Captain, I said, growing serious. It's not vampire. Not vampire. Then what? This belongs to a creature called a succubus. Succubus, he frowned. Like in those old Greek myths? Afraid so. And how can you be so sure? Hazan asked, as I grabbed it up, stuffing it back in my pocket. Because I had a nice little chat with the master of the city, I said, rubbing at the already fading bruise down the side of my face. She do that to you? Captain asked, glaring at the side of my face. You want to press charges, Carver? It's assaulting a police officer in the line of duty right there. Would you really drag her in here, Cap? Goddamn right I would. I could tell he meant it. And I respect the man, shot up a peg or two right there. Brick lawyer would have her out the very next night, but I'd do it just for the hell of it. The embarrassment alone would have her raging for the next 200 years at least. I appreciate the support, Captain. I waved it away. But let's not go upsetting her. Well, at least not until we close this case. I shrugged. So we know what it is. How do we stop it? I know how to kill it, but I simply don't know how to find it. Neither does the master of the city. Bad way to find out. Do you by chance remember Nicholas Tivington at all? Sure, Hazan replied. The renowned psychic who put away that mafia asshole. He was put into protective custody after some serious threats on his life. But he fled the program and went into hiding. But he has a brother, right? Dan Tivington? The captain turned to his computer and rattled off a few keys. Yeah. Dan Tivington resides in New York, status undead citizen of the United States. What do you think, Carver? I'm thinking that he may have stayed in touch with his brother. Hell, he could even be hiding him, for all we know. The damn shame New York doesn't come under our jurisdiction, Azan replied. But perhaps you have a few buddies over there on the force that could help us out. 
I'm afraid not. Most of my old buddies were in the squads with me. They took the pay off and ran. As for anyone else, well, didn't really mingle with regular cops. And I guess we're pretty much screwed, although I can't stop a regular old citizen or an off-duty cop from taking himself a nice little trip across the river, now can I? Hazan said, leaning back comfortably in his chair. Of course, that off-duty cop would have to leave his gun and badge at home. I know, Captain, I said, climbing to my feet. I have a sudden urge to visit my sister. You don't have a sister, Carver. Hazan grinned. Did I say sister? I meant uncle. Well, give him my regards then. Oh, and John, you will remember to leave your gun and badge at home, won't you? I gave him a most reassuring smile. Sure thing, Captain. No worries. No worries at all. Moments later, I was back in my own office, pulling up the address for one Daniel Tivington. Donna was typing away in her own sacred corner of the room. There were two addresses for Daniel Tivington. One, a home address, and the other for a business called Your Money or Your Life. Charming, I muttered, climbing to my feet and stretching, feeling suddenly tired. Donna, I called to her. I'll be out of town tonight. Oh, she replied one perfectly shaped eyebrow raised. Yeah, I shot right back, giving her nothing. You can get a hold of me on my phone. Uh, do me a favor. Get a hold of Jason Hawking. Ask him to meet me here tomorrow morning. I should be back by then. Anything else, Detective? Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. Um, you said you're in charge of administration, so, uh, administrate? Get me a budget. This place could do with a lick of paint. Plus, we may need some other things to help us with the job. Things not usually budgeted for under normal circumstances. Such as, she said, tapping her pencil against her perfectly bow-shaped mouth. Garlic, wooden stakes, silver bullets, UV lamps. Shit, I mean, add on a portable flamethrower, I said, breezing past her. I never stopped to see the look on her face, but I'm betting it was priceless. It was tempting to head straight for New York, but the last two nights had stretched me thin, and besides, I couldn't interview Tivington until nightfall, when he rose from his grave or crawled from whatever hidey hole he now chose to frequent. So instead, I headed for my apartment, grabbed a quick bike to eat, and crashed out. As soon as my head hit the pillow, I was fast asleep, only to be awoken what felt like seconds later by my blaring alarm clock, which now read 4 p.m. Kicking off the covers, I hit the showers quickly dressed. I made sure to leave my gun and badge on the bedside table. A promise was a promise after all. Besides, I had a small arsenal stashed in the trunk of my car. I hadn't mentioned that particular fact to the captain, but then again, he hadn't asked. Grabbing up my car keys, I headed for the parking garage and the city beyond. Daniel Tivington's business address hadn't been hard to find, a squat, one-story building sat in the shadows of a huge mall flanked on either side by a sporting goods store and a small pharmacy, both now dark and shuttered. I looked at my watch. Six o'clock. There were still some late-night shoppers milling around, so I settled down in my seat and waited for the mall to close. I must have drifted off because when I next opened my eyes, it was fully dark and the parking lot was completely deserted. Cursing, I looked at my watch. It was a little over 9 p.m., and there was a late model Porsche parked outside Tivington's building. A soft light glowed from within. A yellow neon sign flashed overhead, announcing your money or your life. Climbing out into the cold night air, I headed for the back of the car, wondering what kind of business Tivington was running here. Not that I really gave a crap. I was here for information on the whereabouts of his brother. Whatever scam he was running was his own business. Arming myself, I slammed the trunk closed and headed for the front door. Not that I was expecting any kind of trouble, but regardless, I always carried around the vamps. Pushing through the door, I entered a small reception-like area filled with fake potted plants and discount artwork. 
The carpet underfoot felt cheap and threadbare as I turned to face the smiling receptionist. She was a shallow-looking blonde who wore a low-cut blouse. Bite marks covered her neck. Some old, some glaringly new. She followed my gaze and sat up straighter, stretching her neck and showing off the bites like a badge of honor. I tried hard not to show my disdain and put on my best PR smile. She smiled back somewhat thinly. Apparently my best PR smile needed a little work. How may I help you this evening, sir? She said in her husky cigarette voice. I'm here to see Daniel Tivington. And do you have an appointment, sir? She smiled, knowing damn well that I didn't. Just tell him Detective John Carver is here to see him. I put a lot of emphasis on the detective part. Let him in, Sandra. A voice crackled from the intercom hidden beneath her desk. The crafty bastard had been listening all along. And take the rest of the night off, Sandra, the voice continued. Sandra didn't have to be told twice, but she grabbed her jacket and purse and headed into the night. As soon as the door swung shut behind her, the door to the inner office was thrown open. I couldn't help but chuckle. Daniel Tivington was maybe 30 years old when he died, and yet there he stood, decked out in full creature of the night garb, all high starched collars, frilly sleeves, and a black flowing cloak. I think he was trying for the ancient vampire vibe, but he just looked like a cheap Hammer House knockoff. Do you find something amusing, detective? He asked, cocking his head quizzically and showing plenty of fang. I was just wondering if you had Christopher Lee back there, I replied. Maybe Boris Karloff? How droll of you, detective, he said, opening the door a little wider. Please, do come in. Undead first, I replied, not wanting to squeeze past him. He nodded and led the way. Sitting down behind his narrow desk, I took the chair opposite. So, what do I owe the pleasure of this visit, detective? Although it would seem you are technically out of your jurisdiction. I have a few questions for you, I answered. And I was wondering if you could help me with an ongoing investigation. Really? So you have questions, do you? Perhaps I have one or two of my own. I mean, it's not like you have a living legend in your office every day. Well, a legend amongst vampire kind, at the very least. Do you know that they use your name to frighten new bloods into submission? Be a good little vampire and follow the human laws, or John Carver will come for you. Do you have a point? Are you just going to sit here telling me things I already know? My point is, if you want my help, he replied, somewhat loftily, I want to know if it's true what they say about you. Because if it is true, that means you're the only one to ever survive the breaking of such a bond. It would make you the first of your kind on record in the vampire history. So tell me, Carver, are you as strong as they say you are, or is it just part of some fucked up legend you and your croonies like to spread about? Let me tell you something. I said, leaning across the table towards him. I don't give a fuck about vampire history or what your kind thinks of me. I'm here because I need to know the whereabouts of your brother. As soon as the words left my lips, he turned on me, his face growing bestial. As he leapt across the table, hissing in rage, I managed to shuffle back, but he grabbed me by the collar and flung me across the room. I landed hard against a flimsy wooden board that gave under my weight. With a shriek of cracking timber and flying splinters, I flew backwards down a set of hard stone steps. Something gave in my side, and I cried out in pain before landing on the cold concrete floor. My gun clattered into the nearby darkness. From my left came a hissing moan and the clank of chains as something recoiled in the shadows. I was moving now, desperate to get on my feet. I almost made it when Tivington leapt from the top of the stairs, driving us both back down, the hissing vampire on top, his talon-like hands speeding towards my exposed throat with a snarl. I caught them up, twisting hard to the left, and the vampire howled in pain as both wrists snapped like rotten twigs. He reared backwards and I placed both hands on his chest and flung him away from me. He landed hard on his back 
just as a filthy streaked hand shot out of the darkness, peeling away half of his face in a crimson welter. Frantically, I searched for my gun, mindful of whatever else lurked in the darkness. My reaching fingers closed around cold steel, and with a cry of triumph, I scooped up my sidearm just as Tivington staggered up the stairs, his body already starting to heal and regenerate as he tried desperately to make his escape. Sighting down the barrel, I popped off around, hitting him hard in the shoulder, spinning him around and sending him crashing down on his back. He slid down the stairs, his ridiculous cloak trailing out behind him. He landed at my feet, grimacing in pain. So, it is true then, he coughed, blood staining his lips. Yeah, it's true, I said, leveling the gun at him before flicking on a nearby light switch illuminating the ghastly scene. There was a naked girl chained to the wall, her body covered in filth and dried blood, her hair matted, mouth torn, shredded, where she howled and gibbered from between her fanged teeth. Revenant, I growled, turning back to face Tivington, who was still down wincing in pain as the sacred silver poisoned his bloodstream. The fuck did you do here, asshole? I could feel a darkness building inside of me, swelling filling me. Whatever this girl had become, she had once been a human being, someone's daughter. She had died down here in the darkness, a plaything to this monster. And just like that, I knew I was going to kill him. The courts would call it murder, but I had another name for it. Justice. Tivington must have seen some of that darkness because he answered me quickly. It was all consensual, he blurted. I have the paperwork upstairs with her signature. She consented to let me feed. I shot him through the knee. He howled in pain, rocking back and forth. She consent to be chained to a wall and tortured too? Jess was into BDSM. She was a real freak. Things just went a little too far is all. I, I tried to save her, to make her one of us. I shot him again in the other kneecap. You're lying, you son of a bitch. You created a revenant, which means you broke her mind after she turned. Please... Please, no more, he begged. I took a deep, shuddering breath and lowered the gun. Okay, I'm going to ask you two questions. And I swear by the blood of Christ, if you lie to me just one more goddamn time, I'll put a round through your heart and you ain't old enough to take that much silver. So here we go. Pop quiz. First question. Why did you attack me? He answered quickly, without hesitation. The master of the city's put a huge bounty on your head, not, not even dead or alive, just, just dead. Bartholomew? I asked, surprised. Bartholomew no longer runs New York. Uh, a new master had taken his place, and he doesn't much like you, Carver. And who is this new master? What's his name? Janus. He replied. He has a reputation for being both brutal and ruthless. So, what's his beef with me? I asked, genuinely puzzled. I don't know, Carver. I swear I don't know. It was nothing personal. I just wanted the money, is all. I ignored that. Okay, second question. Where is your brother? He answered again, quickly. He's living amongst the Strigoi. Those simpletons think that he's, he's some kind of a god. Uh, he's advisor to their leader. Great come all the way to the moldy old apple just to be told that the man I was looking for had been right under my nose all along. Sighing, I lowered my gun and leaned heavily against the wall. Some of that cold anger was leaving me now, replaced by basic common sense. I couldn't kill Tivington, at least not today. Captain Anza already knew I had come to pay this asshole a visit, and then, then there was the lovely Sandra, Tivington's secretary, who could identify me at the scene. The only thing was to make the best of a bad situation. Straightening up, I walked over to the feral vampire, who was still straining, tore at her shackles, cursed with an eternity of madness and a never-ending hunger. In my approach, she lunged forward, pulling the chain around her neck taut as her twisting fingers reached for me. I knew she couldn't hear me or understand my words. But I spoke to her anyway. I'm sorry this happened to you, I said softly. Nobody deserves what happened here. So I'm going to end your suffering. I wanted to say more, 
She deserved more, even. I simply didn't have the words. Raising my gun, I shot her through the forehead, and twice more through the heart. Being so young, she never stood a chance. I didn't know if vampires went to heaven or hell, but anywhere was better than where she had just been. Turning, I strolled back to Tivington. Please, he begged. Please, Carf, don't kill me. I, I have money upstairs in the safe. You, you, you can have it all. Now, how'd you get that money? What kind of scam are you running here? No, no scam, he blurted. A simple trade. People come to us, they give us money, all of their money, every red cent, and in return, we give them immortality. I mean, after all, they have an eternity to reamass their fortunes. The name of the business... The name of the business finally made sense. Your money, or your life. You're nothing but a parasite, Tivington. And you deserve to die, but I can't afford the heat your death will bring me right now, so I'm going to let you live on two conditions. You hearing me, asshole? I said, grinding one boot on his shattered kneecap. Yes! He screamed. Jesus, Carver, I'm listening! Jesus don't want you for no sunbeam, vampire, but it's good to know that I have your attention. Okay, so here goes. Number one, you're going to get rid of that poor girl's body for me, and two, you're going to shut up shop and leave town. If I hear that you've spoken to this new master or tried to contact your brother, I will track you down and I will bleed you slow. Do you understand me? Yes! I understand. Oh, and in a way of parting gifts, I said, aiming my gun at his pit-stained crotch. No, Carver, Carver, wait! I fired twice. And I left him on the stairs, bleeding, before heading up the stairs and leaving the building shutting the door firmly behind me. I was back on my own stomping ground in just over an hour. The traffic had been light at the time of night. I was tired and hungry, but I headed straight for the station, grabbed a stale sandwich from the vendor, and retreated into my office. Thankfully, the ever-watchful Donna had packed it in for the evening to go and do whatever the Donnas of the world did with their free time, and I was left blessedly alone. Firing up the computer, I checked my files. The talk screen had come back from the second victim. Negative results. Which is just about what I had expected. There was also a report on the women from the bar. No change. All were still in some kind of catatonic state, completely unresponsive. Sighing, I wrote up my report about the little chat with Daniel Tivington, leaving out some of the juicier tidbits. The report went something like this. I spoke to Daniel Tivington. He was very cooperative and complied thoroughly with all information requested. I'll let the captain make of that what he wanted. If I mentioned the involvement of the Strigoi, the whole investigation would come to a screeching halt. The Strigoi were something of a gray area. They were vampiric by nature, and yet the vampire nation didn't recognize them as such. I guess when you look like the monster that you are, it isn't very good for vampire PR. Still, the Strigoi were pushing hard for citizenship. Right now, they were living outside of the city by the vampiric council's request. The whole thing was a clusterfuck of gray areas. Turning back to the computer, I hit up the government information website and looked up the Strigoi. The website was public. After all, it was always best to know whatever it was looking around your local neighborhood and all, and if you could still legally put it down. Where the Strigoi was concerned, you could, but only in self-defense. The shoot-on-sight policy had been removed, which meant that they were slowly gaining ground when it came to having the same rights as their vampire cousins. With all the bleeding-heart liberals in Congress these days, I was betting that they'd be warm and cozy under the blanket protection of the new Benson and Hodges law by the end of the year. Scrolling a little further, I came upon the heading, Description, Folklore, and History, Color Photographs and All. The Strigoi were the exact opposite of their vampire counterparts. Where most vampires looked human, the Strigoi most certainly did not. With their sunken noses, slate gray skin, and large, pointed ears that looked like a mixture of Nosferatu from the old black-and-white movie and some kind of fucked-up rabid elf. 
In essence, they looked every inch the monster they truly were. Even if I could understand a degree why the vamps didn't want these monstrosities lurking around the city. Even I could understand to a degree why the vamps didn't want these monstrosities lurking around the city. Happy to flick off the photograph, I hit the origins page, but this entire section was surprisingly blank. Just then, there came a polite cough, and I looked up quickly, right into the smiling face of Jason Hawkins, who stood in the doorway dressed in full jogging attire, a steaming cup of coffee in hand. You look pretty engrossed there, buddy, he said, sipping at his coffee as he entered the room. Lovely Donna said you wanted to see me, he said, wiggling his eyebrows suggestively. Yeah, in the morning, I said. Glancing at my watch, it was already 6 a.m. Oh, time sure did fly when you were having fun. Take a seat, Jason, I said, nodding to a nearby chair on the opposite side of my desk. So here we are, I grinned at him. Interviewer and interviewee. You know, Carver, this is technically my day off before I transition back to the day shift, so if it's all the same to you, can we cut the crap and you just tell me what it is you want so I can carry on with my morning jog? Okay, I'll keep it simple. I want you to come work for me. I want you on the squad. He said nothing, but sipped his coffee thoughtfully before answering. One question, Carver, why do you want me on the squad? Because I need men, I answered truthfully. And because the captain said you're a good detective and loyal to a fault. I also read your file. You used to be on the Miami SWAT team before you made detective and started working narcotics. Eventually, you transferred to the homicide division and came here to the city of midnight. Why is that, Jason? Why'd you come here to Vamp Central? Money, he replied. I came because the pay is better. Marsha just got pregnant with our second child. I... Needed the money. That the only reason? I asked, not quite buying his answer. No, he sighed, tossing his now empty cup into the trash. I guess not. Ever since I was little, I had an obsession with the supernatural. Now, the first book I remember reading, after Dick and Jane, that is, was an abridged version of Dracula. After that, I was hooked, so with the money being better and chance to work with the creatures I had always believed to be nothing more than a myth, I jumped at the chance. Hell, Carver, those old books and films, they don't compare to the horror of the real thing. You more than anyone should know what they're capable of. Sure. I've seen them at the worst, and I think you may have too. That's why I want you on the squad, Jason, because I know... You don't trust him. Now tell me if I'm wrong. You're wrong, he answered. But don't get me wrong, Carver. I don't hate them. Not like you do. And if what I heard about you is true, it seems like you have good reason. That's something I want to know before I make my decision. I don't want to hear it. All of it. I want to know what kind of man I'm working for. Now it's personal. If you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. I'm trying to blackmail you in any way. I won't work with you unless you level with me. It's a trust issue is all. Nothing else. I sat back in my chair and I thought it over. If Jason was going to be a part of the squad, he would be putting his life in jeopardy. Almost on a nightly basis, not just for the squad, but also for me. Didn't he deserve the truth? Wasn't he entitled to it? All right, Jason. Close the door, lock it. I want you word anything that I say in this room stays in this room. Quickly, he got up and locked the door. Give you my word, Carver, he said, sitting back down. Anything you say is strictly between you and me, whether I decide to take that job or not. All right. I said, getting more comfortable for the telling of it. This is how it all began. As you know, I was in it right from the beginning. I left the forces and went straight into the newly formed squad. 
It's hard looking back on it to describe exactly who we were and what we were. This was kind of anti-terrorism squad for the undead. Back then, the vamps didn't have the same rights they have today. You could say that they were on a kind of social probation. For the most part, they behaved themselves. They tried hard to fit in, but there's always those dissident among any other group of people. You know, those who oppose authority and law. The vamps, it was the anti-human movement. Those who wanted to stay hidden in the dark. Those who wanted to feed and murder. It was like the good old days of yesteryear. To them, the human race was nothing more than cattle. And they'd be slaughtered at will. It'd be food for the superior vampire race. It was these factions we were sent after. I predominantly worked out in New York. But if the governor of another state requested our assistance, we were more than happy to oblige. In this case, it was Boston that needed our help. A group of gangbangers wanted the edge over their rivals. They vamped up. Now they ran the entire south side dealing drugs, weapons out of a certain high-rise apartment block. Even the cops had refused to go down there. It seemed after dark the entire area was crawling with flame-eyed demons, some of them sporting automatic weapons. Now they tried a few daytime raids, you know, going in hard and fast, but they had been met with fierce resistance by those humans who seemed to always gravitate toward the undead. Who knows what they'd been promised, you know, drugs, money, perhaps even immortality. Either way, they fought like devils to keep the police out. In the end, overwhelmed and underfunded, they called us in before they planned on just firebombing the entire area and calling it a day. The plan was simple. A ground attack was completely out of the question, and so we'd go in from the air. A chopper would drop us off under the roof. We'd work our way down, clearing each floor as we went. Our orders were clear. Anyone in that building was classed as hostile and should be treated with extreme prejudice, human and vamp alike. So on a foggy winter's morning, we flew in, chasing the sunrise. There were 50 of us in total. You may think that wasn't enough, but you were... You're talking highly trained individuals here. Some like myself with years of experience. We were also toting the best equipment the good old U.S. of A. could muster. Some silver-tipped explosive tracer rounds. One-man compact flamethrowers. We had guns and knives. Sharp sticks. We had it all. Although the thought of using a flamethrower in such a tight quarters made my balls feel tight and uncomfortable. Still, they were good for clearing rooms and... As anyone in the building was classified as hostile, we didn't have to worry too much about collateral damage. The initial entry and deployment went well. Each chopper swooped in low, the men downing onto the roof. The entire thing took less than two minutes. After that, we breached the door, we rolled in a few shrapnel grenades, taking out those who had come to bid us welcome. They were, for the most part, human. But a few vamps lay around groaning. Given time, they'd heal and be back on their feet. But their time was up. We ran in through the clearing smoke, took their heads before making our way down into the building on the next floor. Even through my respirator, I could hear the cries for the alarm. I'd taken them completely unprepared. You know, still, they were gathering their defenses, and automatic fire now rang all about us as they ducked in and out of apartment rooms trying to slow our advance. There were more vamps awakened by the attack, but our silver tip rounds and garlic and few smoke grenades, they took them down. Yeah. More of our men died that day from machine gun fire than any real damage from a fang and claw. We cleared about half the building. The police forces and SWAT teams are now joined from the street level, a coordinated attack meant to sow terror and discord amongst the undead and their croonies. I remember unloading a clip into a snarling vampire's face when an explosion rocked the building. I felt fingers like steel grips on the back of my neck, a flash of pain in my head, and for a little while, I knew no more. When I did wake up, I woke up into a living hell. I was naked, 
I was chained to the wall in some kind of subterranean basement safe room. Sat across from me was a vampire in an ornate leather chair that stood out in stark contrast to the bare concrete walls. He grinned a ghoulish grin at me as I opened my eyes. <laughs> Detective Carver, so glad to see that little knock on the head I gave you didn't do any real damage. After a thousand years, one has a tendency to forget one's strength. I tried to reply, but my head was throbbing. The womb was spinning. Suddenly, my stomach violently spasmed. I leaned over and I threw up. The pain in my head roared. The vampire chuckled. The gamay of a little concussion, detective. I think you may have a little concussion, detective, but don't worry. It won't be troubling you for very much longer. Fuck, I spat, clearing some of the crap out of my mouth. If you're gonna kill me, just get on with it. I feel bad enough without having to listen to you run your mouth. At this, he laughed uproariously. Ah, John. You don't mind if I call you John. After all, we're going to become very close, you and I. I was starting to get a very bad feeling. Death, you know, I could handle. When one worked in the squads, it seemed like death was always sitting on your shoulder. But that last statement sent a bolt of dread through my body. You've cost me much, John, he continued, beginning to pace the room restlessly. The human's desire for narcotics was making me millions. I've been both a prince and a pauper in my long, long life, and now just... But that's all right, John, he said coming to kneel beside me, because you're going to help me rebuild that which you've destroyed. Of course, you must be punished a little first. We can always take care of that later. But, he sighed, rolling up the sleeves of his expensive shirt, first things first. As I watched on in horror, he bit deeply into his wrist, so his cold, viscous blood began to flow. I tried to back away to push myself to the stone-cold wall, but he caught me up by the jaw, his iron vice-like grip surprising my jaw apart. You will serve me, Carver, for all eternity. You shall serve me, and I, Santino Albibus, shall have much renown amongst my kindred for bringing the great vampire slayer, John Carver, under my dominion. I tried to raise my arms, you know, to fend him off, to move my head, to scream, and then he thrust his wrist into my mouth. His blood poured down my throat, up into my nose, suffocating me, forcing me to swallow it down. The world was fading, it was growing darker, my head going far away, and at last, mercifully, I, I passed out. I awoke the next night unchained in my own apartment floor. The first thing I saw was my dead wife. Her eyes glazed, her throat torn out. Oh God, I moaned, scrambling over to her on my knees and hugging her. Oh my God, Teresa, no. Daddy, small voice whimpered. Helen and I cried, I scrambled to my feet. Santino was sat at the kitchen table, my little girl upon his knee. She looked pale, terribly small. She was only eight at the time. Let her go, you son of a bitch, I growled, pacing towards him, my hands like claws, ready to tear him apart. Stop, he suddenly commanded, and just like that, I was unable to move. No matter how much I tried, I couldn't make my body obey. It was as if... I was literally frozen to the spot. I will kill you slowly for this. I hissed at him. If you so much as harm a hair on her head, I will make you scream for death. Silence, he commanded again. And it was as if my very throat closed upon itself. You will do nothing. You are mine, Carver, my human servant forevermore. Didn't I tell you, didn't I warn you there would be consequences for your actions? Don't worry, he said. 
stroking Helena's fine blonde hair. You will forget them over the long centuries and learn to love me. But for now... And that said, he tore her head to one side and struck hard, fastening onto her. She never screamed. She never made a sound. She just looked at me. Hopelessly. One arm reaching for me, tears streaming down her face. Daddy, she whispered. One final time. Before the light faded from her eyes and Santino cast her away from him like some broken rag doll. Well, he sighed, taking a pocket watch from his waistcoat. I'm afraid you slept long and deep, John. And so it seems we shall be spending the day here at your abode. I shall take the master bedroom, he said, wiping away my family's blood from his face with a silken handkerchief. And you shall sit here amongst the ruin of your own making and reflect. Tomorrow night we shall move on and talk about this unpleasantness no more as master and servant. For now, sit and do not move. And that said, he strolled into the bedroom and I had once... And that said, he strode into the bedroom I had once shared with my wife and gently closed the door behind him. I don't know how long I sat there. Images of my daughter and wife snuggled up together in the couch. Helena's first steps, the first time she'd smiled up at me, learning to braid her fine silken hair, sleeping beside her in her tiny bed, when the nightmares had come. The smell of her, the joy at her birth. My only child. My beloved daughter now a bloody heap, fed upon and discarded like trash. Anger. Anger was burning through me, a red-hot hatred coursing through my veins, lighting my brain and body on fire. His words echoed in my ringing ears. You'll forget them and learn to love me. You will forget them. And I started to strain, the sweat running down my face. Still, I couldn't move. I sat like that for hours. You love me. You will forget them. At last, when the sun was high in the sky, my finger twitched. It was hardly anything, yet it felt like, like I had moved a mountain. Still, I wouldn't let up, even though my throat was parched and my body saturated with sweat. I bore down. You will love me. Suddenly, my whole hand moved an involuntary twitch. It was coming faster now, my body coming slowly back to life, driven by my love and my loss, but most of all, my burning hatred and my need for vengeance. And suddenly, just like that, I was free, at least for now. But another command from my so-called master would freeze me back in place, and if that happened, I knew I'd never be free of him again. So slowly on my hands and knees, I crawled over to my daughter and I scooped her up. It was... There were no tears left, just a aching sadness and rage. Placing her with her mother, I slowly, mindful of the creaks on the wooden floor, made my way to my office. A small box room I converted some years back to do my busy work. I contained nothing more than a swivel chair and a large oak desk. It's from the drawers of this desk that I took a nine millimeter loaded with blessed silver. I took some holy water, a small bottle of holy water, and I made my way to the bedroom. I didn't hesitate, but I kicked open the door. Santino awoke immediately and sat up in bed, opening his mouth possibly to give another command, but snarling. I emptied an entire clip into the lower half of his face, blowing his jaw apart and shearing his spine. 
When the gun was emptied, I cast it away and I leapt on top of him, half paralyzed and mad with pain. He managed to swipe at me, but I ducked under his flailing arms and upended the holy water straight into his crimson eyes, blinding him forever. He shrieked in agony from what was left of his ruined mouth, but I wasn't done with him yet. Quickly, I found my gun, I shoved in another clip, and I shot him. I shot him through the heart a dozen. A sudden pain also lanced through my own chest, and I realized it was the newly formed connection finally working against me, and still, still I ignored it. I ignored the pain. Running on adrenaline and fury, I grabbed his legs and I dragged him into the kitchen, and there I threw open the curtains and let the cleaning rays of the sun go about their grisly work. He began to thrash, his body beginning to steam, his flesh splitting open, his blood catching fire. I was now also burning. There was no smoke or fire, but I could feel the terrible pain, causing me to scream and wither beside him, knowing he meant to take me down into death with him, but inside... Inside, I was laughing. Even through the insane pain, I laughed, and I relished his death as his body began to fall apart and my breathing suddenly stopped. As did my heart. And I joined him in death. Or so, I supposed. Six months later, I awoke in a clean hospital bed. Apparently a neighbor heard the gunfire and called the police who had broken into the apartment, seeing the burning vampire and myself lying still beside him. The... They had started CPR until the EMTs had arrived to get my heart started again. From there I was evac to the closest medical facility where I stayed in a coma for six months. When I awoke, the doctors called it a medical miracle that I hadn't suffered any kind of brain damage. I knew it was no miracle. It was the evil that now lived inside of me. My master was dead, but his blood still corrupted me, and I'd never be a normal man again. I spent only a few days in the hospital. My body healed itself at a frightful pace, and I was now faster and stronger than ever, but damned. I have been damned ever since. And that's why I hate them. They killed my family. And I believe they've condemned my soul to eternal damnation. Jesus Christ. Jesus Carver. Hawking said, licking his lips nervously. I heard some rumors about you, but I didn't know about your family, your little girl. And he swallowed hard, probably thinking of his own kids back home. Yeah. People talk, Jason. We both know that, but what I really want to know is that you come join the squad. That you come work for me. Shit, Carver. He grinned at me. I guess I'm in. After that, I sent him home and emailed the captain with his transfer request. Later that day, he came back and we went through his knowledge of the undead and how to kill him. Neither of us wanted to spend time and effort on a training course, but Hawking knew his stuff. I'd even had some basic training with the Miami SWAT. We also went down to the range where he showed me he was most proficient with all manner of firearms. By the time he got back to the office, I had already filled him in on our current case. You know, Jason said as we entered the building, if you want to know more about the Strigoi, why don't you just ask our resident vampire? I turned to him. What? Who do you mean? Donna, he replied. You know the two-century-old stunning redhead that just happens to work in your office with you? Our office. I corrected. Not yet, buddy, he laughed. Not till the captain signs off on those transfer papers. Well, I'll get right on that, I called after him. He waved at me over his shoulder and went back to his case files, leaving me alone. Okay, I sighed. Let's go talk to Donna.
Donna was at her desk like she had never left. We only had one active case at the moment, but her desk was littered with papers and official-looking forms. She was muttering angrily to herself in what I believed to be French as I entered the room. So, you're back, she said, as I took off my coat and tossed it over the back of my chair. Yeah, I'm back. And did you get the information you were so desperately seeking? Yeah, I replied, and I should ton of trouble to go with it. But tell me, Donna, what do you know of the Strigoi? She gave me a long, hard look. Why do you ask, Detective? Does it have anything to do with our case? My case, actually. I snapped back at her. You just work here. Very well, she said, standing and waving her arms over her desk. Perhaps you'd like to carry on with the filing of these damnable forms in triplicate, may I add? I looked at her desk and decided perhaps a gentler tone would be more appropriate. Look, Donna... I only slept in over 24 hours, and I'm feeling a little strung out, so maybe you could please just answer the question. If that's your idea of an apology, Carver, it could use some work, but we can work on that. You were asking after the Strigoi, what did you want to know and why? I could tell I wasn't going to get a damn thing out of her without answering her questions first. Fine, I gave up. Yes, it has something to do with this case. The guy I need to talk to, Nicholas Tivington. He's he's living among the Strigoi. I need his help with something, and, and I'd like to know everything about what could most likely be a potential enemy. She thought about that for a moment. If the Strigoi have Tivington, they won't give him up without a fight. They're dumb creatures, easily impressed. They would see a powerful psychic like Tivington as someone of great importance, probably a kind of mascot or a trophy to use as a display of power. But why ask me about them? And surely you know just as much about them as I do. Well, let's find out. Why don't you tell me what you know, so we can compare notes. Very well, she sighed. I've only ever met one of the Strigoi, and only briefly. It was around the turn of the 19th century. I was in Poland at the time, deep in the forest. I believe I was chasing a peasant girl. She stopped to look at my face. Those were less enlightened times, detective. And a girl must eat. Anyway, she continued. I had tracked the girl down and was going in for the kill when one of the Strigoi attacked me, throwing me to the ground. Not that it really intended me any harm. It was the girl it was after, and believe me, detective, the girl would have not suffered in my embrace. However, the Strigoi like to take their time with their victims. They just don't feed on blood, but also pain and fear. So, it's more than just blood. They need fear and pain to survive, or they just they're sadistic assholes? No, detective, she answered, straightening her skirt. It's more than a desire. It's a necessity. I believe fear, maybe even adrenaline in the blood, is somehow a part of their dietary requirements. Like I said, they are unsophisticated creatures. Unlike yourself, I growled, unable to help myself. The way she had so casually talked about hunting a victim through the woods made me sick of the sight of her, but I needed to keep myself in check if I wanted more information. But I knew one thing. Her days as a working member of this new squad were numbered. I don't hunt for sport. She shot back, her eyes flashing. Nor have I ever tried to terrorize my victims. I only ever hunted to survive. If you knew the things that I've tried throughout the long years, trying to drink the blood of animals, almost to the point of death, until this thing inside of me forced me to feed on some unfortunate victim once again, feeding on the sick and the dying, their infected blood causing me pain and sickness, until my body eventually purged the poison. I've even tried feeding from the dead. You know nothing about me, Carver. Nothing. That's when I realized. Donna hated what she was. It was forced on you, wasn't it? I guess. You never wanted it. She stood then. I won't work with you, Carver. I can't work with your hatred and your bigotry. I don't give a damn what the vampire ministry wants. Fuck them. Fuck you. 
Lucky was heading for the door now, and I came around my desk and reached for her, trying to take her gently by the arm, but she turned on me, fangs flashing, and I let her go. Last thing I needed was a highly pissed off vampire rampaging through the precinct house. Great work, John, I muttered, grabbing up my jacket and chasing after her. I caught up with her on the street, but didn't try to touch her or get too close. Look, Donna! Donna, I'm sorry, I blurted. I didn't know. I mean, who could have known? She turned on me then. Thankfully, some of her anger had melted away. Perhaps if you had taken the time to actually speak to me, instead of tarring all vampires with that same proverbial brush that you have heard my story and perhaps understood me a little bit better. You're right. I said, holding up my hands. You're right. I... I should have made a little more effort, so... How about we go for a drink or something and we could talk? It sounded lame, even in my own ears. Still, it earned me the ghost of a smile. Not now, Carver. I'm vexed with you. We can talk soon, if you like. After all, I know your story. It's only fair if you also know mine. That said... She turned and walked away. But you'll be back tomorrow night, right? I called after her. I don't fancy doing all that paperwork alone. She said nothing, but turned a corner and was gone. Suddenly things didn't seem so simple. No longer a case of black and white. Good, evil. Shades of gray, I muttered the cold night air frosting my breath. Goddamn shades of gray. I just want to point you guys in the direction of the snake's paw. If you guys are listening right now on a podcast, then hey, uh, you're pretty much already there. If you're not listening on the podcast and you're listening on the YouTube, then hey, you're basically already there. The Snake's Paw is written by Jack Townsend, who also happens to write Tales from the Gas Station, and Finding Vanessa, which I've heard that some of you people like. If you want to find some more of his amazing writing, as well as a full cast of voices that is brought to life within this amazing podcast that's hilarious and frightening at the same time, then I strongly, strongly suggest you check it out. That's The Snake's Paw, and you can also go to thesnakespaw.com. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, Brimstone Pandemonium, Cal Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canazales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Buddy Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Crownable, Amber Clark, Jake Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estebean, Nick Cole, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Levita Galvin, That Creepy Check, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Paralinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ike Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Spikamel, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricket, Ready Cougar, Lisa Cottrell, Katie's Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming. 